following show is being broadcast from an undisclosed location. Two former special operators have combined their badassery and now sharing it with the world. They ain't alive no more. All with a beer and a smile. This is the Savage Actual Podcast. And now your hosts, combat vets with 20 plus deployments between the two of them and enough testosterone to operate the power grid of Los Angeles. Savage Actual. Now your hosts, Jason and Patrick. All right, what's yeah. up, everybody? I'm Jason with Savage Actual, and we got Papa Patrick on the other end. What's up, Patrick? Hello, 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 everybody. We have a very special <laughs> guest, Mr. Tito Ortiz. Wrong. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Good to fucking see you again, yes, man. Sure. So I had the uh, – we just knocked this thing over. See that? <laughs> Did you see that lunchbox <laughs> hand? Look at the size yeah. difference of this fucking hand, man. Like, so I think I have pretty decent hands, and he puts his hands up. It's like, oh, man. <laughs> He's got some lunch boxes. But well, uh Tito, what are you Tito, what are you six one, six two? Uh six three. I'm about oh, to uh, six, okay. that's, two, that's, five that's, around. that's, that's yeah, pretty yeah. respectable. But, so but yeah. you goddamn, yeah, your fucking hands are huge. Holy shit. Yeah, let's do that again. Let's do that again. Look at that shit. <laughs> And he's punching. Oh my those. god! Uh, no thanks. But uh, I met Tito through Real Warriors Foundation two years, I think, two years ago. Uh, three years ago, it was right in 2020. Damn, time's flying by. You're right. Time's flying by. Three years ago. So, Mr. Tito is from uh, Huntington Beach, Huntington Bad Boy, Huntington Beach Bad Boy. Excuse me, and he's a diehard fisherman, and he's a fucking patriot, and loves vets, and uh, he. We didn't have to push him too hard. He jumped on with us like really quickly and met all the bros. And uh, we've taken quite a few veterans out together um, through Real Warriors Foundation, mostly out of San Diego. Uh, so yeah, we some, saved, saved some lives, actually. You yeah. know, uh, one of the guys uh, that came fishing out with us on the overnight trips, because we're doing overnight trips, which is a big difference because you're able to get up, be on the water and wake up in the morning and you're in the middle of nowhere. But uh, he had a drinking problem. And that was one of the trips that we had. Uh, no alcohol on the boat. And I had some great conversations through that day and a half I was with him and changed his life, man. He stopped drinking and he's like, I need to be responsible for my actions. And uh, he's living a good life now. I think he's in Wyoming. And uh, wow. I, think was I remember the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, if I can help just one out of any of them that yeah. I talk with, uh, I'm doing my job as a civilian. You know, I, I never served myself. Uh, I've, I've been to Iraq uh, six times from 2005, 2011. The USO brought me out there. Of course, during that time, I was former world champion with UFC. And uh, since 2001, uh, 9 11, it felt like I had to help off our country. And be getting in the cage and fighting was hard work and dedication and put my life on the line. But educating all, or excuse me, entertaining all the fans that I've had, and especially all the ones that were serving across seas of watching my fights, they loved them. And I got an opportunity through USO to go to Iraq and I uh, went to Bethesda and Walter Reed um, the day mm. prior of flying out to Iraq. And I visited a lot of uh, our brothers there that came back from war. And the IEDs were huge that were hitting a lot of the guys yeah. and, you know, missing the side of their heads, size of their ribs, arms, legs. Just it was a shell shock situation for me where I never seen anything like that in my life. And I realized this is what the fuck I get myself into. I'm like, yeah. it kind of scared me a little bit. You know, we went to lunch and I didn't eat lunch because I was kind of affected by it. And yeah, for sure. I, I came to realize that I put a smile on their face. They're like, wow, man, you came here to visit me. And then in my mind, the next day I was flying out of DC to, um, uh, was it uh, Kuwait? And I was going to help change some lives and give a little bit of uh, home back to them in a different country. And it changed my as um, aspect just in america in general because going there there's savages there man i mean not just the people in general is it's scary they don't care uh when you see people walking down the street and they got ak's and uh, our soldiers can't do anything until the weapons are being pointed or even fired at them um dangerous scary and when i got back home i realized how important america is to me and at that time i had a child jacob uh who was two years old and actually he was four years old and hmm. For his future, uh, I had to be outspoken. I had to, you know, to kind of speak up and help out their veterans who did come home because at that time there was a lot of veterans who did come back and from war and people were hating on them. 
And those are the people that understand of how much this country is important to the future of our kids, but for us in general of coming back and being appreciated and yeah. everything I possibly can do. You know, I visit almost every base in the United States, you know, from, oh, I didn't know that. yeah, from California at, um, was it Camp Pendleton to, you know, West Virginia, you know, Fort Benning in uh, Georgia. I mean, I've been to a lot of bases. I worked with a lot of special force guys just to help out and talk with them, you know, and nights going out drinking with them and, or waking up early in the morning, going out shooting, you know, just kind of release some stress and I get it. And yeah. They, they respected just the fact that I was willing to go out and do it all for free. I never got paid for anything I did. I did it all That's just awesome. of, uh, just the patriotism of this country of giving back to our, our veterans, man. It's important. Yeah, brother. That's some good shit. What do you think about yeah, that, that's, man? It's <clears throat> it's funny to hear a, a civilian who's like, "Oh, I've been to Iraq six times." It is <laughs> it's just right. Like, yeah, it's crazy, and it's man. I got, I I I have to respect that because especially I'm sure after the the first or second time, and it's like like you said, going to Walter Reed and you see yeah. how these guys come back. I mean, it's still yeah, dangerous it being there. You yeah, I mean, you still have to fly in. You still have to traverse the ground and are in, in country and it's, it's, uh, it's a sketchy place. So, so it, let's, let's you, man, for, for, let's, let's, for doing that. Sorry, brother. Yeah. Let's talk about that, man. Like it brings a really cool point that I'm interested in is like, you know, Patrick and I, guys like us are like heavily trained, you know, physically to do the job and mentally, like it's a byproduct to like you prepare mentally to go over there and like right. you want it, you want to fight. So yeah. and you being a fighter, I totally get that. The mindset is there. But just no training on the on the, the militant side, like how was that, dude? Like you get this call, like yo, do you want to go hang out with the USO and go overseas to Iraq? Like what? Well, what, I mean, what I, are you thinking? Man? <laughs> I got that call and I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go. And I was like, well, people say no, like no, they say no all the time. <laughs> I, I dude, was like, I got a quick question oh. for you. Do they? So do they give you any kind of like? Like, because I'm assuming you fly into like big Baghdad International, go to the green zone, or you go to some of these other bases. Do they give you? I, I I'm sure you had a helmet. You probably had armor, all that stuff. Do they give you like a brief? Hey, if this happens or this goes down, we want you to go here. We want you to go there, or just don't move. Or what? What kind of brief do they give you for that? Well, when I first got there, um, like I said, I went to uh, DC. From DC, uh, we flew to um, Iraq or to Kuwait. And in Kuwait, when I was there, they kind of briefed us at the hotel a little bit. You know, I just stay with your host at all times. And uh, usually it was a former ranger. Um, there's a couple a couple of the guys a few later on in the years that I went that they were on. What is it when they pull them out of the military for doing something bad? Um, oh, dishonorably discharged? Yeah, dishonorably discharged. But they, they he was fighting it because they said that he was torturing someone to get information which was at that time, I guess he lost like six of his guys. They got pinned down in an area for like a week and he lost six of his guys out of uh, 15 of them. And the, there was, they were fighting against snipers in this one little um, location, I guess, in Iraq somewhere. But uh, hmm. just the briefing they gave us was very simple, very easy. Um, you know, whenever we traveled, because uh, I, I visit about 19 bases from Iraq all the way to the Turkish border. Um, I mean, I visit... I visit from 2,000 to 3,000 uh, soldiers all the way up to 10. I mean, I would stop in little small places in the Black Hawk, or we take the C-130 and we're doing the, um, was it aerial landing? Where yep. the, the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was emergency, not emergency landing. Uh, the combat landing. Combat dude. landing, there we go. Uh, I think there's another word for it, I forgot it too, but yeah. something like that, yeah. yeah. And But I mean, always keep your helmet on, keep your vest on. And I was like, that's not a problem at all. And um, I believe I was in, um, uh, victory over America is uh, that Saddam Hussein's palace? Uh, Camp Victory. I think. Camp Victory. I think so. Camp Victory. I think so. Yeah, I was there, and there was incoming during that time, and we're at a yellow, and um, I was freaking out. I was like, "What the hell?" And what do you mean incoming? And the guys there, special force guys that I ended up meeting, like, "Ah, don't worry about it. It's, it our guys will take care of that shit. Don't worry about it." Yeah. But I mean, being a civilian coming to that point, I, I was like just the like, wow factors, like yeah, the wow factors there, and you know, I, I, I just. I watch a lot of films that, you know, kind of um, like simulate of what happened in Iraq of just situation of people coming in and, um, you know, like little kids coming in selling stuff and giving information out. I've seen that stuff happening and you see kids that are there <laughs> setting up, selling little DVDs and stuff. And you go buy the DVDs and you can hear them listen to conversations of other guys. And then all of a sudden the kids weren't there anymore. 
I was like, wow. And then I'm watching some movies. I'm like, there's some correlation in that where that's just real. Yeah, man. But, uh, you know, I, I, the briefings in general, like I say, were pretty, really simple. Um, s- stayed with uh, my host at all times. Listen to them at all times. Uh, but I got to shoot a lot of great guns. Uh, I got a lot of great advice from some guys. I was able to speak in front of, you know, sometimes, like I said, 2,000 uh, soldiers. And just for that 30 minutes or that two hours that I was with them to conversate with them, just to help show them of what team leadership of working with each other, because the correlation between fighting and being a, a soldier, no, we're not using a weapon, but we're using our hands to knock someone out and it's me against another person. But we have our team and our team of jujitsu guys, the best in the world, the kickboxer guys, the best in the world, the wrestlers, the best in the world, weight trainers, the best in the world, my uh, nutritionist is the best in the world. And he's, they're training me to be the best I possibly can be in the time to step in the, in the cage. So there's a lot of things I was able to correlate with the other um, for sure soldiers that were there that at that two hours, that hour there, they forgot where they were. They thought they were in America and just hanging out with Tito Ortiz. And I remember leaving <laughs> one of the times and one of the generals came up to me and I was leaving with General Joe Williams. And he was like, Tito, thank you very much for coming here because I've seen the smile on these guys' face I haven't seen in a long time. Yeah. And that's what made me want to come back again and again and again and again. And then I had my twin boys in uh, 2009 and I went 2009, 2010, 2011, and they were about three. And I had some situations at home that I had to be a parent. I had to make a responsibility as a parent of taking care of my kids because right. my ex didn't want to do it. She didn't want to be a parent. I got it. So I had to control my family. So I told the USO, you know, I, I can't come anymore. I, I got to be a parent right now. And um, I wish I could still go now. Um, I, like I say, I... But with this uh, administration that's here, I kind of like iffy. I'm, <laughs> I, I don't want to leave my guys out there hanging to dry to go out there and, and, and do what they're doing to risk their lives for our country and, and not showing that I have support. So I'm able to do it from online and do shows like this to kind of help our guys yeah, when brother. they are out there serving or they do come home that we appreciate them. We love them. And, uh, you know, you guys aren't alone. You know, we're, we're here to talk. We're here to like, give you guys information here you, to, to kind of give you guys an example to know once again, that you're not alone that, you know, for me, I, I've been fighting for 25 years. Um, and that's probably the longest um, competitor in UFC history, but my career is done. Um, fuck. What do I do now? Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of like hung out to dry where it's like, now I got to figure out my own life. I got to figure out the things to make me happy to get that adrenaline rush, to get those things to make me like I'm back on the battlefield and not, no disrespect to anyone, but not in a gun manner, but or to defend my life and defend my country. But now it's like I got to protect my children. You know, I got to yep. protect my family. I got to protect myself. Um, but how do I find that adrenaline rush? How do I find those things to make me wake right. up every day and feel happy and feel, feel prideful of this country? And of course, right now it's just so toxic of the things that are going on with our government. And I, I, I um, Got to keep it simple at the end of the day, the knowing that I can only control the environment that's in my circle. I control my kids. I control my family. I control my friends. That's it. it. Everything else is just white, white noise. That's all. That's all it is. Is white noise. Dude, I had a an ex. Um, I won't even get into the whole story, but her mom told me something. Her, <laughs> he's probably heard it. But her mom told me something, man. I called over there late, and she was out late. I was like worried about her. Obviously, I was super young. I was like twenty three. But she's like, yo, Jason, you've got this thing, this invisible circle around your feet called the sphere of influence. She's like, the only thing you could control was basically from that line to the other side. That's it. You. That's it. That's Everyone it. else outside of that, you can't unless it's forced. And do you really want to do that? Like, yeah. not really. So like, she's like, she's going to do what she's going to do. Yeah. And I, I was 23. And that right. was 20 years ago. And I right. still, I'm telling you this now, like, what you just said is 100% true. It's yeah, like- in 2000, was it 21, I figured it out finally. Because, of course, in Huntington Beach, where I used to live, I live now here in Florida, uh, in Fort, um, Cape Coral. I moved my whole family, uprooted everything and moved out. And the reason I did, because what's happening in California right now is just disgusting what they're trying to do to the kids. Um, I ran for city council. Um, I got the most votes in Huntington Beach history. And I'm not a politician. And I've said that over and over again. I'm not a politician. I'm not a shine politician. I've never done it ever before. I never even did political science in, in high school. I mean, I did it to get my classes through to graduate, but still, I never really understood it. I never understood how deep things got. I never saw how shady things were, but I'm a conservative um, Republican that, uh, oh, I guess I'm not a Republican because there's rhinos. So um, 
I, I guess I'm a conservative that loves this country and I care about the future of my, my children. I care about the future of this uh, country of our forefathers that have fought for um, the constitution that we have. And I was getting canceled. Um, they were making up lies. Yeah, hey, hey Tito, can we, can we, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can, can, like, uh, that's super interesting because you don't see a lot of guys that, that, I mean, there's, and I definitely put you in the realm of sort of the celebrity type of thing. You don't see a lot of celebrities who necessarily go into politics. And obviously you had a really deep drive in, in belief in, in, in how you felt about things to do that. So like you said, you ran, you got huge support from the community and you, you made it onto the city council. Like what was the, what was the other members of the city council who were probably most of them had, have probably been on the city council for years. You know how it is. These people get ingrained into the, into that political life and they don't change. And it's, it's, that's something that we see throughout this country, like, you know, in Congress and all that, you just have these people who are around forever. <laughs> how did, how did those people in the city council look at you when you showed up? I, I, I that's gotta be something that's pretty interesting. Well, I think they kind of thought that they could control me. They didn't realize that, Tito Ortiz, the Huntington <laughs> bad boy, that always pushed the limits, always pushed the uh, <laughs> look harder and harder and harder. And, and um, when I was there, I had conservative views. You know, I love America. I love my freedom. I love my faith. And, you know, I love my family. And at the end of the day, that's why I ran for city council, because I saw Huntington Beach changing. And it has changed hugely. But here in this last uh, election, they actually got four conservatives because the public seen how the city nice. council treated me. There was uh, another city council member, Eric Peterson, who is a former Marine, uh, a Republican, same views as me, but the rest were Democrats. So I was going to spend my wills for two years and they're going to ruin my name. They're saying I was robbing from the government. They were just making, I mean, because I wouldn't wear a mask. I was like, that's bullshit. Go ahead and look it up from 19 years old. Spanish flu. Spanish that. flu. You know, um, people, there's 1.3 million people died from pneumonia of having a dirty mask on. And I was like, whenever you go to the hospital, and I've been in the hospital, I've had eight major surgeries, neck surgeries, back surgery, knee surgeries. And every time the doctor goes from room to room, he takes the mask off and puts a new one on. These guys are like yep. riding around with the mask on their car uh, windshield or their uh, visor or inside their pocket. And it's so polluted that you're putting that pollution on your face. So when it came to city council, I was like, I'm not wearing a mask. They're like, well, you have to wear a mask. They're like, I don't have to do anything. I go, do you show me in where the law says I have to wear a mask? They're like, well, there's this. I'm like, no, that's just hearsay. That's that's your guys' opinion. I'm not doing it. I go, you guys are going to have to arrest me to get me out of city council. So from that point on, when I was <laughs> city council, I literally was doing it by Zoom the whole time. All my, Pretty much all my city council uh, meetings were all by Zoom because of this. And, you know, I get it. We're going through the whole COVID situation. And, you know, there was this big pandemic that was happening, which I called the plandemic when I got sworn in. Um, I'm honest. <laughs> I, 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 I love it. I, I see the truth. I see how it is. There's no bullshit. There's no lies. I got to be honest with myself and look in the mirror at night. And the reason I say this is because I went to Trump's rally um, in uh, Newport Beach and everybody had to get COVID test. Um, I was in the round table, which was, I mean, there's like 15 other people there and you're with Trump and you're with the, um, the head uh, congressman and you got to ask questions of Trump. Well, everybody got to take, had to take uh, the um, COVID test, but I didn't. Now they let me into the. Um, um, <laughs> why didn't Why didn't they make you take the COVID test? Because it was bullshit. It was all bullshit. <laughs> Did all you bullshit. just tell them "fuck you"? I'm not doing it. No, no, I did. They never even asked me. They just let me in. They, then I mean, I know Donald Trump, and I've known him since 2001. I fought at the Trump Plaza. That's hilarious. Hall. I, That's I right. did the Celebrity right. Apprentice with him in 2008. Oh, I forgot about that. But it, it, yeah, yeah, it wasn't a factor that they were letting me in because I was Tito Ortiz. They're letting me in because they knew it was all bullshit. And for them to suppress, <laughs> suppress the information that there was, when Trump came out and he talked about ivermectin, he talked about hydroxychloroquine, all these people automatically started assuming that, oh, he's talking about drinking bleach. It's like people are so ignorant. They're not stupid. They're just ignorant and they're just displaced of what the truth truly is because they believe in their own truth. And people say, well, what's your truth? Well, the truth is, is find the facts of what everybody's saying. There were so many doctors in California that were being canceled. They were being shut up. They were being suppressed of telling the truth. And all this information now is coming out. Back yep. then, like people called me a conspiracy theorist. I said, bullshit, I'm a spoiler alert because I'm telling you what's going to happen here in the future. And now it's coming into fruition. And then it hurts my heart because I lost one of my uh, best friends, my head coach, uh, Saul Solis, to COVID. 
Um, and I tried to get him the, um, the medication, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine to heal him. The doctor said it's not a part of the protocol. We can't do that, Tito. They put him on, Jesus a, um, Christ. They put him on a ventilator. He <clears throat> died two weeks later. And this is like one of my best friends. And he, it was so heart wrenching that I, I just, it infuriated me and it made me want to fight more and fight harder. And that's when they started attacking me more. And I was like, said, you know what? I'm going to spin my wheels here for 600 bucks a month and then ruin my name as they've been doing to Trump. Cause I mean, like again, Trump's a billionaire, man. He lost $1 billion being president of the United States and still not accepting any money of being a president and giving the money back to our soldiers of the money that he was supposed to earn. But yep. at the end of the day, it was, I could only control what was my environment. And in 2000, was it uh, New Year's of 2021? I was in Vegas and the New Year or the bell or the ball dropped and everything. And I sat there to myself. I was at a bar with my wife and a couple of her friends. And I thought to myself, is Tito, you can't control any of this. You can't control, you can only, you try to do it on a city level and you got smashed. You try to speak out, keep trying to give the people information. They're going to call you, you know, you're, a CTE guy from fighting, you're dumb, you don't know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about because I lived it. Now that uh, there's a new Speaker of the House, it seems like uh, life's coming back full circle. And for all these people that have tried to destroy this country, it's going to come out and bite them in the ass. And I hope and I pray to it. And like I say, I, I, I follow politics more than I ever have in my life. Um, and I see what's going on in this world. And I see the control that you're trying to do. And it's a big push. And the big push was in 2020 with the mask to see if people complied. And everybody complied completely. No one pushed back. But besides, you know, there's a few people who did, like myself, and, you know, a couple hundred other thousand people that did. There's a lot of doctors trying to push back. They were getting threatened to getting their license taken away. Some did. Yeah. yeah and some did. Um, a, a few of my friends who actually lost their jobs for not taking the vaccination are getting yeah. paid now. <laughs> they asked me for <clears throat> information. They asked me for my opinion. What I said, I could do just hold down until they fire you. Because when they fire you and all this stuff goes back by, they're going to have to end up reading pain for that time that you're in your job. And I swear I got like 15 calls of friends who are like, dude, I just made 50 fucking grand, man. Oh, like, like so much. Pay? They got back pay and their job back. Well, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of military guys that were forced out from all the services who refused the shot or you know, wanted to refrain from getting it for, for religious purposes. Right. And they forced all these guys out. And now that there's a, there is a big push now to get these, this, you know, everybody reinstated. So I don't know how that's going to go, but I, uh, more power to them. Yeah, for sure. And I, I seen that the government just actually made it uh, not legal for any military to make it mandatory to get vaccinated now. So I mean, we're winning. Really? We're winning step by step, you know, little by little. I mean, just kind of grabbing it back to back to the country. And I think it's important. I mean, a lot of soldiers out there, a lot of uh, veterans out there, just we got to keep with a good fight. Uh, once again, only what we can control and what we control controls in our circle. And we got thank God that we have Internet and things like this uh, for social media that we could actually be able to speak out and, and not really speak out, but just tell the truth. Be honest, you know, through the things that we've learned through life, the things we learned through trials and errors yeah. and just do the right thing. Just conversate, conversate yes. freely without it getting shut down. I mean, whatever your opinion is. That's, yeah, I mean, that, that's what America is about. We should be able to have an opinion yep. to argue back and forth. Supposed and say, to be. You know what? You're right. I'm wrong. You're right. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. You're right. I mean, it can go back and forth. I'm with you. And that's, so, that's the, you know, through this whole thing too. It's not uh, so much of this stuff. People get on the liberal conservative side of things for myself and, and a lot of my friends. It's not, it's not about one side or the other. It's just having that freedom to, you know, we're yeah. in a country where we're supposed to be free and you're, we're supposed to be free to make our own decisions. And that's the, that's the shitty thing is so much of stuff that's gone on the last couple of years. It's, it's like, we're, it's not, we're not living in a free country, you know? Uh, it yeah. seems like a dream. It's like a nightmare. I'm just waiting to wake up. It's like, yeah. I literally uprooted my whole family from California to move to Florida for the safety of my kids. So they're not taught critical race theory. They're not, taught sexual transgender information it's like these are my kids this is this is my job as a parent to teach them like my kids yep. didn't even know what a black kid was until they're in the fifth grade like we don't talk like that that's that's i treat a person by their character and not by the color of their skin and these are the type of things yep. i'm trying to teach kids to be victims of society and it's wrong it's completely wrong don't be a victim be a victor work your ass off to make the right things right 
and to treat people the way you want to be treated, treat them with respect. But if they want to be ignorant, then that's the, that's who they are, and they'll show their colors. Like I say, life comes full circle, and over this last two and a half years, three years, um, things are coming full circle. Things are coming back, and people are starting to understand. I'm starting to wake up a little bit, and I'm thankful that uh, a lot of of my friends and my doctors and people that I, that I have I've been associated with are on my side and being here in Florida, like I say, I, I lived 47 years in Huntington beach my whole life. And to come here, it's a breath of fresh air. It, it, it gave me hope after the hurricane. I was here for two weeks after the hurricane. I, I, I mean, two days after the hurricane, I was here for two weeks and I helped out getting generators, fuel, water to all the, uh, was it Matt Lachey Island, Pine Island, yep. Northern Captiva. And to see the community come together, that's what America is about. When people help each other and, and help thy neighbor, right? That's what it's supposed to truly be. And to see that, it gave me hope for this country. And when I seen that, and then I was uh, down in Lee County with, uh, was it uh, Sheriff Carmine? And he took me to the AI that's in um, the headquarters of Sheriff. And there's video cameras on every corner, every street light, in every school. There's two officers in every school. And I gotta thank uh, Ron DeSantis, who's an amazing governor for this uh, state. There's an officer in every school at least one to two, if there's any over like, I think 3,000 kids and there's three. I didn't know that. Yep. But then they had this AI where there's a, a, a camera in every school, in every classroom. So whenever anything, anything happens, any shooter situation happens. Pops off. They're like, there within a minute. Sirens go off. Sirens go wow, off. That's pretty impressive. <clears throat> it's it's, it's right. important though, the safety of our children. That's why I brought my kids here. I was like, and it's cool because now I'm here, I have no worries. I mean, the political stuff, I don't have to worry about because I can tune it out. I'm here in, in Florida, I don't have to worry about it. My kids, they go to school, I don't have to worry about it. They're fine. And it's crazy how because- long, after How those, long have they had those, how long have they had those cameras in the in the classroom? I'm not sure or how in the long. schools? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how long. Um, I, I just, I recognized that right off the bat and I was like, wow, that's, that's security right there. And it, it made me that's happy, awesome. it made me feel secure that at any time at all, whenever anything happens, they get a call, they can put a camera right to that situation, right there, right then, automatic. And it's wow. like, th that made me feel safety for my kids. Like I say, the safety of my children is my number one job, is making sure they're safe. Yeah. But, you know, my kids were in school for a week. They came home on a Friday, and I was like, boys, how's, how was school as we do every day? And like, dad, <laughs> it is amazing here. Everybody is so cool, and we don't have no weirdos <laughs> here. I go, what do you mean you have no weirdos here? <laughs> Like, dad, there's like no kids that are girls that are trying to be guys. and There's, there's no guys that are trying to be girls. It's like, everybody's normal. I'm like, welcome to America, son. That's why we came here. Did they have that in their in, in California? They have any of that yeah. shit going on in their classes? Yeah, oh having the classes. I mean, there was a situation that one of the teachers, who's a history teacher, was trying to tell our kids, or my sons, that uh, slavery was started from Christianity. Now, anybody who are... <laughs> I, I, I was lost for words. I was like, and, I was, and he's like, dad, is it our fault? Because I mean, because we're Christians. He's like, dad, is it our fault? I'm like, no, 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 no. This is bullshit. He's, that's a complete lie. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a huge, you know, Bible thumper. You know, I believe in God as a higher source. I just believe in being a good man, treat others like the way you want to be treated, you know. But when that happened, I was like, okay, there's my one red flag. And then uh, there's another situation that happened that uh, my son, one of my friends, Sean Whalen, who owns Lions Not Sheep, and he had a t-shirt on and said, uh, Lions Not Sheep. And my son was walking to class, and the same teacher goes, get in the class, you sheep, to my kid. And my, oh. my, my whole just anger <laughs> level went, whoop, almost went past my head. And I was like, I had to call an officer friends. I was like, hey, this situation happened. What do I do? He's all, you need to go to the principal, and you need to make it, just have a conversation with them. Went to the principal. I talked to him about it, and he's all, "I've been a, I've been a good teacher from here. We're just trying to get people's opinions on this." I go, "Yeah, but to put down my child in front of his friends like that, I go, that's wrong for you to do." He's like, "Yeah, but there's other uh, um, other fathers and other mothers or other parents that said how great of a job I've been doing." I go, "But yeah, but now your opinion is coming into the classroom of things that that's your opinion. You need to stick to the curriculum of teaching. That's it, history." That's it. That's your job. That's all you should stick to. He's like, yeah, we wish I had to do current affairs. I go, but current affairs right now, it's so disinformation or not right or wrong or, you know, the things that are being taught are not correct in a lot of ways. And you can't have people's opinions and have your own opinion on something that's not even on the topic of what you're trying to teach to the kids. So that was one of the things that I kind of was God like, damn. you know what, this I, I can't do this school stuff anymore there. So literally uproot my whole family, sell everything, come here. 
it was a hard thing to swallow, but you know what? Now I did it. I don't have any worries. Um, I'm in America. <laughs> like I say right here on the shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, make you, America Florida or make Florida America. I mean, last time I saw you were, you were getting ready to sell your house. Uh, I think it was on the market. And I remember, you know, you and I in the golf cart, you were telling me like, the house I'm in that we ate at your place, you're like, yeah, I've always wanted this house. This was my castle. I'm going to die in this castle. And I thought it was a cool analogy. And I remember tell, you telling me that you, you know, you want it out. You're getting ready to move. And I just, I thought to myself, like, God damn, that, that's, that's a big shift. It was you know, to make shift. you, your whole life goal is to be in this area to where you are at now to like, I mean, is it quitting? Like, I don't think it's quitting. No, I think it's surviving. It was actually, it was for the safety of my children. Yeah. It was not to be selfish for my own views. And this goes back to my last relationship with my twin's mother. I had to do that same situation where I loved yeah. her. I mean, I would fucking kill for her. I would take a bullet for her. But it got so serious and so vicious and just toxic that I had to get, not be selfish on my own feelings. I had to be think about my kid's future. And my mother made the same decision when I was 13. She told my father, you, you get sober, I'm taking your son away. And I give my mom praise because she got sober and she took took me away from my father and gave me another opportunity. I mean, and I come from a wrestling background. I started wrestling as a freshman in high school. And my true name is Jacob. So all you viewers, my true name is Jacob. Uh, and in the Bible, Jacob wrestled against an angel. The angel beat him and saved his life. Well, I found wrestling. Wrestling saved my life. And it got me where I am today through hard work, dedication, you know, honor, respect, and just, just working super hard. And I'm able to give this to my children now. So when I made that decision for my kids when they were three and a half, it was the best decision in the world because they not they didn't have to see any of that toxicity. They didn't have to see any of the drug use. They didn't have to see all the stuff that I went through during the time that I was with my ex. And it was hard. It was challenging because I tried to fix her. And when I went to therapy, I come to realize that I was trying to fix my mom and I couldn't fix my mom. And he goes, Tito, you need to stop trying to fix somebody. You need to find someone to help you. And I did. My wife now, uh, Amber Ortiz, Thankfully, uh, I've been with her for 10 years. Uh, we got married on uh, Veterans Day of this last year. Well, I don't know. It was 10 years. Yeah. Nice. yeah 10 years together. <clears throat> but, uh, I, I found that angel. God sent me an angel. God sent me someone to save me. And she's my back. She's my backbone. She supports me. You know, she's hard on my kids, which is great, but still loving. Um, she's that mother figure that if you opened up a book and say how to be a mother, she's that person. To a T. And I'm very thankful for my, my wife, Amber. I love her like with all my heart. I'll literally take a bullet for her. I'll fucking kill someone if I had to for her. It wouldn't matter <laughs> because she was, she's a something for me. She's a ride or die. I mean, in 2020, and, and this will be the first thing anybody's ever heard this, but in 2020, um, I haven't made a bunch of money through UFC. Yes, I've made millions, but still, you pay half to the government. You got to pay your trainers. You got to, yeah. you know, yeah. I live a nice life. I have nice cars. I have a nice boat, but still, you got to obtain that certain lifestyle. And it came to a point at the end of 2020 that I had $5,000 in the bank and I have a $25,000 overhead on my mom's house, my home, my car payments. I was like losing my shit. And my wife goes, Tito, don't worry about it. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to help out and we're going to make this work. And I mean, either it's God above, give me blessing me from, you know, for great things. And people reached out to me and I was able to get some more work. And then I fought Anderson Silva in 2021. And I made a big chunk of money again and everything happened for a reason. But I was willing to sacrifice myself because I took that fight against Anderson Silva on a one month notice. Um, I was 240 pounds. They wanted to get me down. Right. To, they wanted to get me down to 195 pounds. Um, in that month, I got down to 200 pounds the day before the fight. I almost killed myself. But once again, I was willing Damn. to sacrifice everything for my family. And like I say, life comes full circle. Everything's great. Everything's wonderful. I, I got a solid family. And it was through the, the sacrifices that I did through my life or through that time to get where I am right now. And I know Amber was willing to ride or die with me. She didn't give a fuck how much money I had. She didn't care what I had. She knew she had two kids to take care of. She knew she had a man to help take care of. And we have a family that's, you know, it's a nuclear family. It's a solid family. We love our country. I mean, she, she's she been to Iraq herself and Germany, I think, uh, seven times. I know that. Yeah, she's gone also. To, she was uh, a, she was, she worked for the UFC too, right? She was, uh, she, uh, did she work as a ring girl? girl or? Yeah, ring yeah ring that's girl. awesome. Yeah. But that's awesome. That's, and that's how, is that how you guys met? Yeah. Um, well, so we, we met um, in, what was it? Uh, England with the UFC because we'd always travel as like a big family. That was back when UFC was literally a, like a family. And we traveled to England for a fight and her and another one of the ring card girls uh, 
we went out to go eat. I guess we had some sushi. And so we went out to go eat. And, you know, I'm an alpha male. I protect. And my job was to protect them, man. My job was like, anybody got close. Like, we we're walking through, like, we went to a bar to go drink. And we like went to go sit to a table. And guys are just, they wouldn't get out of the way. So I'm like, kind of like making a roadblock to them and like kind of walk them through. Like, wow, I never had a guy do this for me before. I was like, I oh, know, don't worry about it. You're good. You're good. And we walked through. And, I'm respectful, man. I treat girls with respect. You know, yeah. I don't help myself hire anybody else ever. You know? But she really respected that. She thought I was just a brash, cocky fighter. You know, the Tito T's, the Heights Beach bad boy. But that's what the TV says, right? Yeah, the T, that's what the TV says. And, you know, that's the role that I try to play. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm a real man. I cry. You know, I bleed the same as everyone else. Uh, you know, I have feelings. I have emotions. Uh, but when it comes down to being – who I am. I mean, I'm an Aquarius. Uh, my birthday's next week on the 23rd. Um, uh, if you read up what an Aquarius is to the T, I am that. I mean, I, I really don't, I haven't really followed that until the last like 20 years. And I was realized, wow, that's me. That's it's kind of creepy, right? It, it's creepy, but it's yeah. cool because you know, <laughs> realize it shows what type of person I truly am. Cause I mean, I'm a, I'm a caring person. I'm a protector. I, I, I'll that get, makes you a better. I'm going to cut you off there. No, it's fine. Because there's that misconception on the special forces side too. Like we're just fucking robots. Yeah, killer robots, and that's all you guys do. No. But dude, I think the best warriors are have the biggest hearts. Yes, and that makes you a better warrior because it's empathy. Yes, you know when to turn that fucking light switch on and off. Right? And I love that you just said that because it's, yeah. it's dead on, dude. And, and you, it's you important to, to make because, and like I say, I mean, there's times when you guys want to go. I mean. I don't know because I've never been there, but when you go out and there's live fire and you guys are going down range and it's fucking, it's, it's go time. That switch needs to be on. Same thing when it's fighting to me, when, you know, Bert Watson, um, who was the guy for the head for UFC and he was like, all right, let's roll. It was like, I grabbed my American, American and Mexican flag and I'd yeah. be walking and man, I'd be crying. I'd be crying when I'm walking and it's not the crying of like pain or like, Oh my God, why am I here? It's like joy. It was. An emotion that I realized in 2005 that was the fear leaving my body. By the time I walked into the cage, my tears were gone and I felt invincible. I almost felt like a god or just like fucking no one's going to touch me. I'm going to smash this guy. And it was, I felt invincible. But that was the walk that I did. And anybody watch all my old fights and you guys yeah. see me walking out and you'll see tears coming down. And it was just, I made it. From a kid that from the streets that were parents or um, heroin addicts. I'm thinking my mom got sober and, and took me away from my father. But who lived on government cheese, powder milk, uh, beans, cutting the green off of the cheese to make grilled cheese sandwiches, living in motels, living in cars, living in garages, living in trailer parks. I went through so much hard time as a kid that I worked so hard to get where I was to be a world champion that I looked and there's 15,000 people in the arena screaming my name and that adrenaline rush, there's nothing like that adrenaline rush and controlling it to get into the fight, to not making mistakes and going out there and it's me versus another man. And I literally, I'm going to get killed. Or I'm going to get choked out. Or I'm going to get knocked out, get embarrassed in front of all my fans and my family. And God, I don't want that to happen. That pressure's got to be fucking crazy. The pressure is the cr night before the fight. Pressure is no pressure like that. No so how, how did you fucking deal with that, dude? Uh, a dude. lot of, lots of, a lot of mental focus, a lot of mental focus, a lot of, uh, uh, mind preparation where I'd walk myself through it. I do a lot of visualization of walking out. Like literally I'll walk out and I'll see the arena. I'll, I'll see the fans. I'll see them screaming. I'll see them yelling. I'll, I'll get all the way through the whole fight of getting thrown the first punch or getting hit with a punch. How am I going to react? What's going to be a situation that my body's going to respond to? But visualization was huge for me. And I learned that in wrestling because we would do that. Our coach would turn off the lights in the room. He'd have us sit down. Be like, all right, first period. Should I shake hands and go? And we literally go through the whole match, that two, that two minutes. They're like, all right, stop. What are your choice? A top, bottom, or defer? And it's like, I would put myself to that whole situation. So when I got into my fighting career, I put myself in those same situations. So they started that that mindset even then. Yeah. I mean, That's I, awesome. Yeah. That's I think it was my, my junior year, my senior year in high school, we started doing that. And that, uh, one of my old coaches, Paul Herrera, who wrestled at Nebraska University, who helped me, he, he put us through that. But the stuff that works in your mind is so untapped and people need to tap into it a little bit more because it's so powerful and it'll get you through the hardest times in the world because there's so many people that think they need to quit. People that say, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. You know what? Those are the challenges that God give us. God gives us those challenges to see what type of character we truly are. And if we're able to battle through those demons and work past those things, it makes you stronger makes you like even a tougher soldier. Like all of a sudden, man, you're the fucking general of your own world. You're like, I I'm going to take this shit and make it happen. 
And, and I see a lot of guys and I wish they had more motivational speakers that those guys would listen to, to understand that your mind is so powerful. It'll get you to those things, but you gotta understand how to control it, understand how to just get through step by step. And what I used to do when I was in high school wrestling, cause I was learning, I was wrestling with the varsity guys. And I was getting my ass kicked every day. was like, God, I, I gotta go through three months of this to, you know what Tito, just today, just today, get through today, just get through today. The week would go by, I was like, all right, cool, let's start again, Monday, let's just get through today. And every day I would push myself as hard as I possibly could, but I get the best outcome in every day that I did that. And I started thinking past that, thinking the week, thinking the month, thinking the year, that's when it would just be too much too much pressure on myself. Like an avalanche. Yeah. And it would be like an avalanche, exactly. But I would just, like I say, take it day by day, work through that day as hard as you possibly can, and then the next day you wake up, like, thank God, I'm, a, I'm up, I'm at ease, and it's time to go back to work. So transitioning you know, from you know high school, you graduate. I remember you telling me a story I think about how you got into the UFC. I think you were starting to get in some trouble. I think you were at the bar and maybe your old wrestling coach saw you at the bar. Yeah. So this is when I, right when I graduated high school, I graduated um, Huntington Beach High School. And uh, I thought I'd be the big man on campus and I'm going to take over the world as every 18 year old thinks, <laughs> um, you know, they think that their shit don't stink and they kick everyone's ass and it doesn't matter. And they know everything. And I had that mentality and I was working for Allied Moving Service uh, in California in Santa Ana. I was doing 14 hour days and the guys are running like run circles around me doing the show. I'm like, how in the fuck are you guys working so hard for this long? Like, Hey, try some of this. It was methamphetamine. And, um, Jesus I tried Christ. and for about nine months I was hooked. Um, at the time I was about two twenty, and by, I'd say about the eighth month, I was down to 185. God damn. Um, I was at a little local bar, um, called Rhino room. And one of the coaches walked up to me. He's like, Tito? I was like, hey, what's up, Coach Ron? He's like, you all right, man? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing fine. He's like, you don't look so good. I go, what do you mean? He's like, what are you doing now? I'm like, well, I'm working at Allied Moving Service. I'm trying to make ends meet. I got my own apartment. You know, I, I just, I got out of my mom's house. I, I'm going to take over this world. He's like, have you ever thought about coming back and wrestling? I go, yeah, I would love to do that. I go, but I'm on my own. I, I don't have anyone to take care of me. I take care of myself. He's like, well, you're half Mexican, right? I go, yeah, from my father's side. He's like, well, if you get him, I come to my office. We'll see if I can get you financial aid for school. Party that night, got home at like two in, two in the afternoon on Sunday, um, <laughs> raging all night. And I went to go walk in to brush my teeth and I looked in the mirror and it scared the fuck out of me. It scared me really bad because I was 185 pounds, 6'2", um, had pimples all over my face, big black circles under my eyes, and yeah. I was turning to my father. I had a reality check right there. And this was the fork in the road for me where I had realized is either I'm going to continue going on the same way and continue what my father's doing. And my father still does now. And he's 87, I think now I haven't spoken in a long time, but am I going to make the decision to do that? Or am I going to make the decision that this coach gave me this opportunity to come back and wrestle and go back to college? And I remember that Monday morning, I woke up to um, work seven in the morning. I called Ala and I said, you know what, guys, I'm not gonna be able to come in this morning. Like, what do you mean? I go, I want to see what the schooling situation, go back and wrestle, what I can get out of it. I mean, can I just get the day off to kind of go and see and talk to the coach? Like, no, if you don't come in today, you're fired. I go, you know what? I quit. And I don't quit. I don't quit on anything. You know, I just kind of reset everything, go back to drawing board and redo it. And that's what I did. I remember walking in uh, the office of uh, my coach and he had a big smile on his face. He's like, Wow, Tito, I didn't think you were going to be here today. And I go, you know what, coach? Um, I don't want to turn it to my father. He goes, I go, I, I, I want to do something different. I want to do something to change my life. I go, I need to be responsible for my actions. I understand it. I go, I'm not going to be a victim anymore. And I, I need to make this, this work for me. And he smiled and he says, we're going to make it happen. I got a financial aid. They pay for my school and they pay for my books. What, what I, college was this? Uh, that Golden West Junior College in Huntington Beach. Okay. Uh, nice. Got my books paid for. I got a, a, a stipend for every quarter. I think it was like 1500 bucks, and that helped out with my uh, rent. Damn. And I was able to wrestle. I won the state title that year. Um, I started training with Tank Abbott. and who fought Damn, me. your first year you won the state title. Yeah, first year won the state title. So that's you didn't meet Tank in the UFC. That's pretty impressive. Wrestling. I met him, met him wrestling because uh, my high school wrestling coach, Paul Herrera, was uh, Tank Abbott's uh, MMA trainer. So he, he put both of us together because I was a stud at the time. And I mean, I would 
take Tank down, and he'd get so frustrated. I'd hold him down, he couldn't get away from me. He'd get so frustrated. And I remember when he fought Well, he Tank. wasn't really – Tank wasn't, wasn't necessarily like a ground guy, was he? He was more just like – all stand up and fight. Well, I mean, he's a fighter. He's a he's a bar brawler, but he came from a wrestling background. I mean, he wrestled. Oh, he, uh, he wrestled in high school. He wrestled in junior college. So he understood wrestling really well. But just I was strong as shit. I mean, I was smaller, but I was strong as hell. I mean, I have gorilla strength, and I was faster and I could get better <laughs> position. I just had better technique, and I worked a lot harder than he did. But at the same time, it was just something that I learned from him that was maybe I could do this fighting thing. And then I was remember watching one of the UFCs. I think it was like UFC nine and Jerry Bolander fought uh, Kenny Monday, former uh, Olympic champion and Jerry Bolander. I wrestled him in high school and I beat him by like 12 points in, uh, in, in the stadium. And I was like, wow, if I could beat him, he just beat Kenny Monday. Hmm, maybe I could give this a try. So I told Tank, I go, Tank, uh, can you get me a fight? He's like, oh, you want to fight in the UFC? I, yeah, I think I could do well. It was middleweight at the time. There's only two, three weight classes. There was lightweight, middleweight, and heavyweight, and that was it. And I was like, yeah, I want to give it a try. So I went back to my coach. I said, coach, I want to try this UFC thing out. And he's all, are you going to get paid money? I'm all, yeah, I'm, I get a chance to make $25,000 if I win the whole tournament. And he goes, well, you can't do it because you'll lose your scholarship. You lose everything if you go and do that. I go, well, what if I can do it for free? Does that count? He goes, well, you can do that. You want to do it for free? I was like, yeah, I want to see how good I can become. Um, and I'm the only UFC fighter in UFC history to ever fight for free in the UFC. UFC 13, May 30th, 1997. I fought as an alternate for free. And uh, I fought Wes Britain. I stopped him in uh, 32 seconds. Then I was into the finals fighting Guy Metzger, who was uh, king mm-hmm. of pan craze. He was world ranked. And I was dominating him. They separated, put it back on our feet and hit him with the right hand and I went to go shoot and caught me in a choke and I never got caught with that choke ever again, but it was just a learning process to me. And uh, I went back to school, won my second year um, state title at Golden West Junior College. Then I got uh, a full ride to Cal State Bakersfield and me and the coach didn't see eye to eye. So I I ended up uh, leaving. Um, I was going to kick his ass either or, but I ended up leaving. (laughs) I got a job at uh, Spanky's Adult Novelty Store where my brother worked. Uh, I was making 15 bucks an hour, 15% commission. I was making great money. What year was this? Uh, that, that was in 2000, or no, in 96. Okay. 96, uh, no, 97 and 98. That was 97, 97 98. Because what, uh, how far, I can't remember what year the UFC started. How many years was uh, it? It was uh, 93 that they started. So when you fought that first one for yourself. 97. So it had been around for three, four years at that point. Yeah. Okay. Around. And I was afraid of it. I seen those guys. Like, These guys are fucking animals, man. These guys are crazy. They're going in trying to kill each other. It was like David versus Goliath type of thing. I was like, this is it that scared was before, me. That was, wasn't that before um, Dana White bought it, right? What year did he buy UFC? Uh, UFC was bought in 2001. Okay, so, yeah. Because I remember growing up, like – well, I was still in the Marine Corps and the first couple came out and I was just, we were all blown away by this stuff because it was just like, you know, so there was rough. no weight classes. It was just, they were just, right. you know, right. wearing wrestling shoes. Yeah, and man, shit. it was, yeah. it was, some it, wore it, shoes, some did. Time, some guys yeah, for a long time they called it like, that human cockfighting or whatever. And yeah, it was, that, yeah. that's what they marketed and, on. That, that's what uh, the owners, uh, Bob Marowitz and SCG, that's what they market on. You know, two man enter, one man leaves, you know. And then uh, no John rules. Had, had a big push on it of saying, you know, this human right. cockfighting. And the, I, I think the, the, the point of all of it when it happened, that it was really the cement stone that kind of stopped it was Bob Meyer was told uh, John McCain and I believe it was um, Ted Turner that, fuck you, I'm, I'm going to be bigger than you one day. So... I have nothing to worry about. And that's when they went on full force and attacked. And that's when John McCain came in and saying the human cockfighting. And then um, at the time, I beat Vanderlei Silva Silva for the vacant world title. Um, I became the light heavyweight world champion. And then I got a call from uh, one of my trainers, uh, John Lewis. And he says, uh, the Fertitas are thinking about buying uh, the UFC because uh, they know that it's for sale. I go, who? He goes, Lorenzo and Frank Fertitta, the owners of uh, Stasia Casinos. And the next week, I get a call from Dana White and saying, uh, I need to be your manager. I was like, what do you mean you need to be my manager? He goes, I need to be your manager. I worked, worked with uh, Floyd Mayweather, um, let me be your manager. I was like, I don't know who in the hell this guy is. 
Like two days later, he came knocking on my door in my apartment. And his he, his name was not known. At oh, his name was not known at all. He came knocking his door, knocking on my door in my apartment, and he walked in. He's like, "Give me this opportunity. I promise I'll make you more money." And da da da. And at that time, I didn't really didn't have a manager. I was like, "All right." I trusted him. I gave him all my trust. I mean, I'm, I'm loyal as fuck, and I gave him all my trust, and he made me more money. I mean, I went from making fifty grand for a fight to making one hundred eighty thousand for a fight, yeah. and that was like a big step up. I mean, and how old were you at that point? Um, I was twenty. Three, twenty three at that point. Oh, that's so much money. It was, I mean, for Matt not having anything, I mean, I was stoked to get fifteen hundred bucks when I was in college. I was like, holy shit, I got so much money. But and especially back then, back then, I mean, that was like nothing. But I, I, I gave all my trust into Dana. Um, and then all of a sudden, the Petitas bought the company, and then the Petitas told Dana that we want you to become president. Well, Dana was like, well, now I can't be your manager because I can't be president of the UFC because there's a conflict of interest. But I have my good friend uh, James Gallo who's an attorney that will be your manager. Well, my automatic, my radar went up. I was like, oop, there's a conflict of interest there because now this is your best friend. You're the manager or you're the um, president of UFC. Your best buddy who's an attorney, you guys are going to negotiate. And when it comes to negotiating, you guys are going to have a conflict of interest. And that yep. situation did come about because as they started making more and more money, I was like, well, I want this. I want that. And he's like, no, Cheeto, you don't want to do that. Don't ruffle their feathers, man. You don't want to do that. I was like, yeah, yeah. But there's a conflict of interest here. This is your buddy. I mean, I know you guys talk after on the telephone <clears> when I'm not around. You guys are going to be talking about things of what I want and what I don't want. And Damn. It was it was really hard because that's when I lost the trust because I, there was no trust there because there was such a conflict of interest. Yeah. Um, and when the Fertitas bought the company, they bought the company because of me. I mean, I was brash. I mean, I was colorful. I mean, when I spoke, I was very articulate. And yeah, there was times that I had to learn, you know, I went through um, speech classes and, you know, public speaking and stuff that the classes that I did on my own that I paid for myself to help me to nice. educate the fans on what the sport was truly about. Because back then it was just human cockfighting. That's what it was. They're in a cage. They're trying to kill each other. And it was no, there was just so many martial arts that were able to learn to get to the point that it was accepted, you know, worldwide or, you know, in America that, I had a lot of work to do and it was very challenging because I got suppressed so much because I was always the guy, the fighter out there speaking up for the fighters because the guys who were making $2,500 to show and $2,500 to win. And I was like, this doesn't make sense. And I remember this because I tell this story all the time. I remember that I think it was in 2005 and this is after I was a world champion. I lost my world title and uh, Mike Tyson just got out of prison. <laughs> and it was, on, it was on ESPN. It said Mike Tyson made $200 million through his four-year, five-year career, 10-year career, whatever it was. And I remember looking at Dana. I'm like, Dana, when am I going to start making money like that? And he goes, Tito, you'll start making money like that when you start hitting pay-per-views over a million. I was like, deal. I was all in. I did all the promotion. I went, traveled the country. I did everything possible. Me and Chuck Liddell fought for the second time. We got 1.6 million pay-per-view buys. I made... $3 million for that. They made over 90, over 90 million. They made um, one night. I mean, and everybody, all your listeners, all your viewers, you guys are going, holy shit, you know, the 3 million is a lot of money. Well, think of this 3 million, cut that in half. Half goes to the government. Okay. So I got 1.5, a good two, 300 goes to all my trainers, all my coaches, all my, my facility, everything I'm training. You know, I, I walk away with the mill. That mill does not last that long. I mean, money, can be endless, but money goes by super fast. And anybody who's made money, made a million before, how fast that million goes by. But I want longevity in my career. And I, I've, I've been doing it for 25 years, but you know, now I look at it, I, I try to build wealth for my family. I wasn't able to do that because I was suppressed, because I was just talked bad upon, that I was afraid to fight Chuck Liddell, that you know, T was a stupid man and this and that. I mean, if I was so damn stupid, I wouldn't be here with my kids and have the fortunes that I have with my children, have intelligent children, have the businesses I've had through my life. But when Dana didn't do that for me, he didn't keep his word, I come to realize they're all about themselves. And then I, I, I really took it to heart that it was just, just, I fight fire with fire, you know? I, and I think that's might've been my downfall that I'm an honest man and I, resp I expect the respect I give to them and I never got it. I mean, now it's like any of you viewers right now, have you guys even heard of Tito Ortiz on any UFC in the last 15 years? Anything at all? No. They don't do it because they don't want me to be a name. And I, you know, I just recently, and I talked to my wife, Amber, about this. I was like, babe, you know what? I think I'm going to start posting all my fights uh, through the UFC on my Instagram. It's at Tito Ortiz IG. You guys can look it up. Please follow. But uh, I, I, I was like, 
I want to get the new fans to educate on what my career was like during when I fought through the UFC because I had some amazing fights. I fought the top of the top through my whole career. I never fought a nobody. I always fought somebody. You who, were the top of the top. Yeah. yeah I, Not that you just yeah, fought. The, yeah. you, know, you were the fucking equals, bro. All, on, on all levels. Even guys like Trek came in. Like when I fought Luido Machida, who was an undefeated fighter, yeah. and nobody knew who he was. He beat me in a decision, and he became the world champion. So I always fought the toughest guys. Always put my life Didn't you? I, I saw that fight. Did you almost submit him? At the, I almost in the last round, at the very end. Yeah, yeah I almost fuck, got a dude. <laughs> I, I, Me and a I bunch went, of my buddies were watching that fight, and I, I don't know why. That as soon as you, because that just popped in my mind. Because I was just, yeah, I remember that. And uh, everybody talked about that guy. He had never really been known, but like, like, like everybody like, talked about him. Like he was this great fighter. And I was like, who the fuck is this guy? And. Yeah. Uh, that was a great fight, man, and and he was he is he's good he's good and I was like, uh, but I distinctly remember, man, you you had him freaking dead to I rights. Had, I had him in a triangle. It was the last man. round. That was yeah. I had I had him in a triangle. <laughs> I think the last thirty seconds of the fight, I had him in a triangle. But during that time, I was working with Rico Rodriguez, former heavyweight uh, UFC world champ. And we were going from triangle to armbar, triangle to armbar, triangle to armbar, and that was my mistake. If I would have just kept the triangle and secured it and just kept it, I would have tapped the guy out. But I went from triangle to armbar, and that's when he did an alligator roll and got out. Um, but he won the fight fair and square. I, I give it to him. Uh, and it was just at that point, it was the time to defame Tito Ortiz of uh, being a UFC champion to suppress every, all of his views because all of a sudden the fighters started getting smart. They're going, what is this Tito talking about? And to this day, <laughs> they still do. They still talk about the things that I um, was fighting for because they're getting treated the same way. And it, it's sad. I mean, these – the UFC got sold for four point five billion dollars. That's with a B, not M, with a B. I mean, that's four hundred ninety nine million four times. 4. And you guys are times. what made that thing a reality. Yeah, and oh, yeah, no, thing, sure, we got, we got zero out of it. You should have been taken care of for life. Chuck Liddell, which wouldn't have been a lot of money. No, I mean, to take care of all of you guys, especially the fucking forefathers. P- pitch us ten million. <laughs> What's ten million? The four point five billion. Chuck yeah, Liddell, nothing. Tour, Quentin Rampage Jackson, myself. Ken Shamrock. Yes. I mean, we were the ones that made this the sport it is to give these fighters the opportunity for them to sell a company like that, take care of us. I mean, I'm a blue collar guy. For all you viewers, I, I'm not some multi millionaire that I have no worries about bills ever. Shit, I got to worry about my bills every single month. I mean, I, I just still got to work. I still got to bust my ass. I still got to do you know, the blue collar working type of things to provide for my family. And I don't live as good as I did when I was in Huntington Beach. I live in a smaller, I rent a house right now. Um, but these are the type of things that but are you, are you happier? I'm happier. I'm, I'm a lot happier. I'm a lot happier being here in Florida. It, it's been like great. genuinely happy, genuinely happy. Yes. Uh, a little yeah. worried sometimes, but like I say, God puts me in the right areas, introduces me to the right people. Um, if it's meant to happen, it's meant to happen. I just work hard every day. I get up, I think of a way, you know, a new business, uh, reach out to other guys, just in contact, you know, to kind of, you know, brainstorm with people to, you know, the next new thing or you know, something that I could get into. And you know, real estate is something that I want to get into now. So I, I'm meeting some great people here in Florida who are very, 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 very wealthy. And they've seen my career and they've seen the things I've gone through and they want to help. And, the, and you know, that's what America is about when people want to help each other. And, and I think that's really important. But like I say, it's talking to just being a blue collar guy. I, I, I don't see myself better than anybody else. I want to work every day to work as hard as I possibly can. And I want to give my kids wealth. And I had that opportunity with the UFC. It didn't work, but you know I'm on my my next life. You know I, have, I live my life in chapters. You know I'm on my like think, sixth chapter in life now, and it's <laughs> going to be grand. It's going to be glorious, and I'm going to be very thankful for my fans and all the support I get for the people who help me on this. You know this travel that I'm going to do to the next level. But this has been Savage Actual. Jason and Patrick are two former special operations guys who interview interesting guests. Talk about video games airsoft in military subjects basically they drink a lot of beer talk about shooter games and have fun what's not to love we hope you've enjoyed the show if you did make sure to like rate and review and the fellas will be back soon but in the meantime find them on twitter instagram facebook and youtube at savage actual y'all be cool and we'll see you next time